Give me liberty and give me a net. Welcome to Annette on Life, Liberty, and Happiness, a podcast where I talk about the Constitution, history, politics, pretty much anything I want to talk about. And my podcast can be found on AnnetteTalks.com, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and I think a few other places. Amazon Music, that's the latest. Um, if you want to see video of these recordings, go to YouTube.com forward slash AnnetteTalks. If you want to connect on Facebook, go to facebook.com forward slash Annette Talks. And today we are following up an episode that I posted oh, about a week ago. And this is on emotional abuse. And once again, I have the illustrious Brandon Pipkin joining me. Hi, Brandon. Hey, thanks for having me back. You're welcome. That last one I had a lot of great feedback on. I had people talking to me and telling me how powerful it was and how awesome it was. I said, cool, I guess we'll do a second one. Well, we were already planning a second one because this topic yep. is so huge. But um, I'm going to introduce you again for those that did not catch the first one. If you didn't catch the first one, go back and get the first one because there's lots of good information there. Um, and so this is what it says about Mr. Brandon Pipkin. <laughs> the British accent's coming back. <laughs> you can't help that, can you? <laughs> for some reason, the name Brandon Pipkin just puts me in mind Pipkin. of England. Yes, I didn't know. <laughs> If you think something's wrong in your relationship, there is. As an abuse recovery coach, Brandon can help you make sense of the confusion in your relationship and understand, understand if what you've been experiencing is normal and what to do about it if it's not. If you're walking on eggshells, there's hope. Brandon's insight has helped thousands of people gain clarity. He speaks both as an expert and a friend since he gets the frustration and pain of a confusing relationship. You can replace frustration with peace and conflict with hip happiness if you learn a few key ideas. Follow him to learn how to live a better, happier, more fulfilling life. Is that your like 30-second um, elevator uh, speech? Kind of? Yeah, it changes all the time. But. Yeah. All right. Walk and so mind, helping people. Yes, you are. And so you can be found at stopemotionalabuse.net on Insta at stop.emotional.abuse. Pinterest, Pinterest.com forward slash stop emotional abuse and Facebook.com forward slash stop emotional abuse dot coach. And you can be emailed at Brandon at stop emotional abuse dot net, right? It, yep. All right. So last time we talked about how to recognize if you're in an emotionally abusive relationship or if you think somebody else is in one. And we talked about some of the steps to take to recover. And there were three other questions that I wanted to get to because I had posted this, um, to this topic on Facebook and I had a ton of questions that people had. And so I picked the, the top three that I also wanted <laughs> answers to because as people kind of got the idea from in our first episode, uh, I've been in a situation myself where I was emotionally abused, more than one situation. Um, and so I'm doing this partially out of selfish reasons because I would like some of these answers. We can all use a little help um, that have been through the situation. So the three questions that we're going to try to answer tonight, and these all could probably be their own episode, but um, how to stop emotionally abusing yourself, because that continues on after someone else has done it. How to handle the situation where you have a child taking over in emotionally abusing you after you've gotten uh, rid of the spouse or after you've gotten away from the abuser, someone else takes over. Um, and then the third one, how do you learn to trust again? So basically to get into a new relationship. And um, so I, I think, yeah, I can relate to all three of those. So let's take them one at a time. Do you have a favorite one you want to start with or? No, you tell me what's up. All right. Let's do the first one because I, I can't remember who said that. Maybe it was Dr. Phil, someone, somewhere I read that a lot of times we take over for our abuser. Mm -hmm. Like what they said to us verbally eventually becomes a part of our um, inner dialogue. And if you find yourself saying things to yourself that were said to you by the person that was abusing you, that's your own brain taking over for you. And yeah. um, I'm sure we're all guilty of that to some degree even if we weren't abused, we just um, take on negative ideas about ourselves. So yeah. um, what, how can we stop that? Uh, 
As you mentioned, that one thing came to me. First of all, Dr. Phil's voice came to me. How's that working for you? Uh, so yeah, if you hear their voice, that's a good time to, to use your Dr. Phil voice and ask, how's that working for you to hear their voice? A phenomenal counselor put it this way one time, who would you be without that person's voice in your head? And then pursue that. Who would you be without that person's voice in your head? And you're right. So maybe a little bit of background. When an abused person is in a situation over time with intermittent reinforcement, which is the positive message and then the pull away and the negative messaging, it creates this powerful bond. It rewires our brains or our emotions or something. I wish I knew exactly the neuroscience behind it. I don't know that anybody does, but we do know that it's real this bond that gets created with this intermittent reinforcement. And what you do is you keep chasing that person's approval mm. over and over again. It's like Madonna is singing your Cindy Lauper time after time. Hey, you just keep going back. Sing again. I love it. Uh, you need to come on and just sing sometime. <laughs> life, if only life were a musical, right? So time after time, we're chasing their approval, which is why even after that relationship ends, we still hear them and we're still chasing that approval unless we've gone through the seven steps to healing. We talked about that in the previous episode. There are seven steps you need to go through if you really want to heal. And even if you've gone through those steps, it's a continual process. That's why step seven is continually and consciously choose to heal. So what we do is we have that voice in our head. If you're not good enough, you don't measure up. This person's not going to like you because of X or Y. Uh, I know of somebody who was going on a date with somebody new and their ex had made fun of their height. And so uh, he almost felt compelled to say, hey, oh, and by the way, I'm only X feet tall, right? Because that's the most important criteria or whatever, right? But because they had gotten those messages, it still lived with them. One of the coolest things I ever saw was you've already suffered enough. Stop beating yourself up. Give yourself some grace. Right. And realize those messages that tear at your worth are not from a loving father in heaven. No. And you know, that reminds me of actually, um, I think doing these episodes with you and some other things that I'm doing right now, our heavenly father's way of saying, Hey, you need some work in this area. Hmm. But this last general conference, um, I can't remember who said it now, who gave the talk, but he said, to pray, to know how heavenly father sees us. Maybe it was her. Actually. I think this was one hmm. of her females um to pray to know how heavenly father sees us and how that's the way we can know him better and we can see other people uh -huh. that way but yes. so i'm constantly praying like help me to see myself the way you yes. see me heavenly father because i know it's completely different than the way i see myself and what's funny is i also got a blessing last weekend even when i was in houston and one of the things it said was that you need to start seeing yourself the way your friends see you. And wow. I was like, ah, I don't even know what that means. You know, so I'm afraid to ask my friends. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you should, you honestly, you have friends you can trust. You should honestly ask them. Yeah, you're right. Cause he's, he's in, and the, the, my friend that gave me the blessing afterwards, he says, you know, your, your friends see things in you that you can't see in yourself. Yeah. And I thought, gosh, I guess I need to, I, I, I don't know what that is. Like it's still, I have no idea. Yeah. So maybe I need to go and ask because I yes. don't know. But I think turning to positive places to get the to get our reinforcement mm -hmm. and purposely. I, I so I do this all the time. I pray daily. Like Heavenly Father, please help me see myself the way you see me, and let me see other people the way you see them. Yeah. And so those two things should work together, right? Because if we can see other people, yes that way then maybe we can be kinder to ourselves so last time we talked about the shaming messages and in our culture unfortunately not the doctrine in our culture we have used shame to keep people in line for many many years now if you combine two things together the culture of shame and the doctrine of humility you get a lot of self-loathing going on mm -hmm. this self-loathing is what leads to abusive situations and to continually beating ourselves up. And this is why I love President Nelson. And yes, many of the sisters are talking about this lately, which I love, and Elder Uchtdorf too, and Elder Holland, which is this. God does not expect perfection at this stage in the game, but he does expect progress. President Hinckley, do your best. That's all the Lord expects. Elder Holland, Elder uh, Uchtdorf have talked about those things too. 
Am I good enough? Will I make it? Uh, D. Devin Cornish. What's it? What is it? G. Devin Cornish. Whatever. <laughs> so these messages are great because we have this this one two combo that creates that self loathing, and that's why even after we leave those, we still don't want to see our worth. We still don't want to believe it. We don't want to open our hearts to it for two reasons. Number one, because we did to somebody else and it absolutely smacked us. You lived it. Anybody who's been in an abusive situation has lived that. You were vulnerable. You did want somebody to see your real worth and all you got was pain. You're just not up for that again. So we don't even want to go back to father and ask him, what is my real worth? Because we don't want that pain. We don't want to be a disappointment. But I promise you, he is a loving father. And he sees us infinitely different than we see ourselves. Okay. <laughs> uh, that. Oh, I would say, I would add to that, that if you don't believe that, then you need to study more. You need to study the scriptures more and you need to pray more and you need to understand who Heavenly Father is more. To understand... True character. Yes, to understand who he really is and to understand the Savior as a loving Savior. Right. I've been watching The Chosen. I don't know if you've seen that series yet. I have um, not, but I saw you post about it, yeah. Well, it's on BYU TV and a few other places, but um, it it's the life of Christ and you you see him as a as kind of like the way I always picture Christ, very accessible, very kind, very loving, yeah. very accepting, with a sense of humor. And you yeah. just know if you were in the same, if you were with him, if he was with you, that he would do nothing but hug you and love you. Yeah. And so if we can, if we know that, if we understand that, then we're going to be more willing to go to our Heavenly Father and say, So good. Explain to me how you love me. <laughs> I, I had a situation that I was just reminded of this weekend as I retold the story. Several years ago, I was in Boston and I just wanted to connect with somebody and have a real conversation with a beautiful lady and just have an honest, good connection, right? And I've been wanting that for a long time, but it just, I don't find that. I, I don't have that connection. So I was just I feeling so lonely and I was praying to Heavenly Father and I said, could I, could I just have an honest conversation, a great connection? It, this lady over here, she just, she looks beautiful. Can I talk to her? And she and her friend were walking, walking my way. And I thought yeah, this would be great to have this conversation on the streets of Boston and just connect with somebody. And just as I'm saying that prayer, she and her friend turned and started walking the other way. And I was like, Oh, heavenly father, isn't that just plum? Okay. Withhold this from me again. Still always. I get it. I'm not worthy of this connection. You don't really care to give it to me. And as I'm going through this, I suddenly stopped my own mind and I started laughing out loud all by myself on the streets of Boston thinking, that's obviously not how you operate. But I had to laugh at the insanity of my own thought. And I still struggle with that thought, not that very same thought, but the thought of, okay, I know your promises apply to everybody else. I get that. Mm -hmm. I know the atonement is real for everybody else. I know that you love me. I know he loves his children beyond any comprehension. I know it. But then I always have this little exclusion. I, but, but I know I'm a little different. I'm like Joseph of Egypt. You can't let me know it just yet. I have to struggle some more. I have to be in jail right. some more. But for some reason, it's easier to believe that Heavenly so Father loves easier. everybody else. Right. But how could he possibly love me that much? I once got a blessing where it said that Heavenly Father missed me. And I was like, how... How is that even possible, like with billions of children, for him right. to miss me personally? And so right. I still have a hard time wrapping my brain around that thing. How, I, yeah. I doubt it. You know, like how could, I, how could that possibly be the case? But it is the case. He misses all of us. He loves all of us individually. And, and as um, Elder Holland has said in many of his talks, we, he does not love the abuser. He does not love, oh, he does love the abuser. He does not love the abuse. No, he does doesn't not. want any of us to stick around no. that kind of thing. So. No, and if that message is not clear, gosh, I was on another uh, Facebook Live, whatever I was doing, where we talked about that because the abuser will use scripture against you. Yeah. God does not like divorce and God, right? Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. And here's the thing 
God also said, whosoever offends one of these little ones, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea and never were born. Yeah, he doesn't like abuse either. Yeah. No, he's, he's pretty clear on that. I don't know how much clearer you can get than, than that. Yeah. There's no hierarchy here. And there's no threshold of, well, God doesn't mind this much abuse. This much abuse is okay. <laughs> abuse is not part of his plan. Now, does that mean if you're being abused, you have to get out? No. What that means is if you're being abused, figure out what your boundaries are, what you're willing to live with and not live with anymore. Mm -hmm. And the baseline to any relationship is dignity. If you don't have dignity, you don't have a relationship. The Holy Spirit of promise isn't sealing that relationship anyway. Yes. We could go on about that. I don't want to get too far into the weeds. But. I would say um, to close out the, this first question that you if you're still talking to yourself in your mind and and taking over for your abuser it's time to exit that relationship you got out of it physically yes. get out of it mentally now it's time yes. to treat yourself the way you would treat your best friend that's right you would never speak abusively to your best friend we are always kind 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 to our best friend so I say, treat yourself like you would treat your best friend. If you hear yourself talking to yourself in a negative way, stop right there and say, I'm sorry. I love you. I love you. you I am always here for you. We have got to be there for ourselves. Um, the only people we can count on, honestly, in this life, Heavenly Father, our Savior, and ourselves. That's right. And everyone else could let us down at some point and will let us that's down right. at some point. So we've got to be there yeah. for ourselves. And um, Heavenly Father wants yes. that too. Yes. Sorry. Let me touch on a few things as we're closing it out. I closed it. No, no. Okay. We're good. Let's move on to the next one. What is it? Okay, come on. Go for it. Uh, so a couple things. I would just reiterate, really understand the true nature, true nature of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. When you understand that, it will change everything. Number two, I loved what you said. You've exited physically. Now it's time to exit emotionally. Number three, Mosiah 2630. So I was teaching EFY two years ago, and in our stake, we had been talking about the anxiety and depression the youth face in our stake, and what can we do? And finally, a councilman, one of the high counselors said, guys, we've been talking about this. Are we going to talk or do something about it? And it was this nice wake-up call, and so the stake presidency member said, I want everybody to do some research, thinking about it, pondering, come back next month ready to talk about some real stuff. So I had been thinking about it and really digesting it, and then I taught this EFY, and one of the observers is a professor at BYU or a, a faculty member at BYU. And he and I started talking after, and somehow this topic came up, the anxiety and depression. And I mentioned what we were doing in our stake, and he said, you know, this is interesting. I'm actually a stake president back home. And I have looked over the last four years, trying to figure out why we have these elders and sisters coming back because of anxiety and depression. He said, and I've noticed a pattern. And I'm on the edge of my chair at this point, like, please tell me what you're seeing from an ecclesiastical point of view. This is amazing. Somebody else is wrestling with the same things. I can't wait to hear this. And he said, Mosiah 2630. And I'm at EFY and I'm thinking, dang it. I'm supposed to know every scripture forward and backward. And I have no clue what Mosiah 2630 says. I don't know what it is either. Yeah. So I said, can you, and I, even now I'm wondering, is that the reference? I think it is. So I said, I, I don't, I don't know that. Can you help me? And he said, for as often as my people do repent, will I, the Lord, forgive them their trespasses against me? And so, okay, help me with the connection, right? He said, most of these kids come from good, intact LDS families. Strong parents. The kids have been active all their lives, but they don't understand Mosiah 2630. And just then our conversation broke up. I can't remember what happened. But I think in that what he was saying is, we don't understand the true nature of God and we keep beating ourselves up, even if it's not our own fault. For as often as my people repent, will I forgive them of their trespasses? That is why we have the atonement. But gosh sakes, this culture of shame and this doctrine of perfection, we self-loathe because we don't understand what perfection really means, which is complete. Not no holes, not everything good. It means we rely on the Savior. So Mosiah 2630, as often as we repent and as often as we turn to him, he can cover the holes and he can make everything okay. 
Now can I close it? Sounds good. <laughs> All right, that was awesome. It's your show. I'm just a guest. Yeah. Obviously, I don't think I'm just a guest. But. <laughs> oh, you're the professional. I brought you in. All right, so the second one, and these are all, you know, interrelated. Um, yep. So the second one is how do you handle it when a kid takes over yeah. or a, it, in abuse when a spouse leaves? And I'm not going to say that's my situation, but I'm not going to not say that either. Um, yep. But I, I found that I'm sure, you know, I'm not the only one where that's happened, where the oldest, well, at least for me, the oldest kid decides they're going to just do what they saw their parent do. And um, then the rest of the, the family gets to suffer through it. So Isn't what words awesome. of wisdom do you have for this one? C-O-M-M-O-N, not come on, common. It's very common. That's the first thing everyone needs to know. It's just like anything that happens with the abuser. The patterns are so predictable, mm -hmm. so repeatable. Oh, you know I what? And it just occurred to me. Yeah. It's not just having that person in your home now. It's not wanting to send them off and continue oh. that pattern as the abuser. Right. Not, and, and you don't want anybody else, any other kids in the family to continue that pattern as the abused person. We don't want right. that in the family at all. We want right. to eliminate that, erase it, 86, mm -hmm. to quote my Facebook page today. Everyone's debating on them. Everyone was deba we were debating the meaning of 86. It's a political thing. But anyway, yeah. to get rid of that, mm -hmm. we want to end that pattern yeah. on both sides. Right. Isn't that trucker speak, 86 it? No, what actually, I've always heard of 86, if you want to 86 something, that you're killing it or you're getting rid of it. But yeah. I guess there's this 4586 little meme out there that supposedly means kill Trump because he's the 45th president. Uh -huh. uh, what's her name? See, we're doing a little political here. Meg Whitmer, in a recent TV interview, had it behind her on this little block, this 4586. And supposedly, really? it, it was, I mean, I don't know if there's any truth to it, but supposedly there's a group out there that wants to kill him. I mean, I know people want to kill Trump. Yeah. But supposedly that's like their little call sign. Huh. So I had a, somebody, a, a Facebook friend, challenge me and say that 86 only means in restaurant speak that they're all out of this item or whatever. And I'm like, yeah. I've been on this earth for 52 years. I've heard of 86 as kill. So I had to go Snopes it. Anyway, I started yeah. a conversation to ask people, <laughs> what does 86 mean? I can't yeah. be the only one that's ever heard that. And so, yeah, a lot of people said they've heard that means kill. But it can also mean just eliminate or get rid of. Like, I'm going to 86 my shoes because they don't, you know, they're pretty. Yeah, 86 like your shoes, yeah. So we're going to 86, 86 abusive pattern. Yeah, no. right. Yeah, I, I understood that it was trucker speak. I'm going to have to go research now. Yeah, you go find that trucker speak. All right, I'm <laughs> on it. I'm, maybe I'm jumping lanes here and I've got a whole new topic we can talk about next time. Right. Yeah, so it's common. It sucks. It's common like anything with the abuser, right? Within a margin of plus or minus two points, if I meet somebody and hear three or four sentences and I know that there's abuse, I can within accuracy tell them what their story was because this is how common these things are. It just, it's awful. So you remember I said, here's how the abused becomes the abused. Here's how the abuser becomes the abuser from part one. Mm -hmm. and I won't go into it now, but they do what they see. Right. Well, so guess what keeps happening over and over throughout the generations. Mm -hmm. And yet that's one of the reasons why I got out. Cause I said, I don't want, I don't want to right. keep, have my kid, my girls come to me in their twenties and say, mom, yeah. my husband screams at me. I never thought of the other option. Mom, I scream at my husband. I scream at my husband. Yeah. Yep. And golly, it's so messy. I'm, I'm biting my tongue now for a second because in some ways, wouldn't it be wonderful if the child did not have to see that pattern ever again? Mm -hmm. That would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, though, they are mandated by the courts to continue seeing that pattern. Right. And they're going to pick that up. They themselves are either going to pick up abusive tendencies or codependent tendencies. And that's where the others need to help them and ask them questions and set appropriate boundaries mm -hmm. such that you don't let them walk all over you. So this is now to the point of what do you do if a child takes over? Well, number one, you let them know that they're loved 
unconditionally because the abuser's love is always conditional. <clears throat> I have a friend who scored, no, she set the assists record. I think the league assist record at a college during a basketball game. So not a small feat. Mm -hmm. Her mom at the end of the game said, oh, it's too bad you missed that free throw. Mm -hmm. Why is mom focused on this? Because the abuser always focuses on what's wrong. It's a longer explanation. I don't want to get into it, but it comforts them actually to find what's wrong. It's comfortable to them. It's sick. It's twisted. It's their way of controlling the world. So mom, instead of recognizing, wow, amazing job on this feat that is pretty significant. Instead, it's here's what you did wrong. So the, uh, I don't even remember where I was going with that because I got lost. Love them unconditionally. That was the first one. Thank you. So the message that this friend got was the way I approve of you is conditional on your performance, your actions. Mm -hmm. You, as you are right now, are not lovable. You have to perform in order to be loved. That's the damning message. So you can let them know, love you, accept you no matter what, there are just some behaviors that aren't going to fly. And I, I think we may have talked about it in um, episode one, which is this. If they're starting with some of those behaviors, it's to call a timeout and say, look, honey, I love you. And I do want to talk to you about this topic. This is an important thing, but the way we're in interacting right now doesn't work for me. So let's take a break and let's come back when we can do it in a much more productive way. Now you see there's no accusations there and you're owning your own experience. I'm more than happy to have this conversation with you because I love you and this is important to me. The way we're interacting right now though does not work for me. So you're setting a boundary and you're, you're showing them how they ought to act in life, which is if something doesn't work for you, you can back away. And you're teaching them if something doesn't work for somebody else, you don't press it because that's what abusers love to do. How many people who have been abused have had the abuser follow them around and insist that they have a conversation? Hey, I'm trying to sleep. Nope, we need to have this conversation right now. We can't go to bed angry. President Monson said, never go to bed angry. You know, so much great advice that's given in the church and through traditional counselors is wonderful in healthy relationships. Yeah. But with an abuser, if you take that to heart, never go to bed angry, guess what? You're going to be up until six because for eight hours, you're going to hear about everything you did wrong. And finally, you're going to relent just to get the argument and the conversation over. It's not healthy. Or, hey, I'm taking the car keys so you can't go anywhere. That one's happened. And what most people and what most people don't know, them taking the car keys and preventing your free movement, that's physical abuse. Yes, it is. Blocking the doorway, that's abuse. Grabbing your arm so you can't leave, so you have to stay on the premise. That's physical abuse. Mm -hmm. All of that is abuse. The abuser, of course, will say, well, I'm not letting you drive right now because you're so mad. I'm worried what you'll do. And it's that same abuser who actually, when they get ticked and they're driving, will drive erratically. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Let's talk about driving. Woo! Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? Uh -huh. So, man, I get so wound up about Let me... Let me wasubi, wasabi. Oh, what is it? Yeah. Is it? Yeah, there you go. So let them know that they're loved unconditionally. And sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. Did you have something on oh, that? I was just going to say, I was just going to do the same thing, though, start enumerating again. And people, if you're just listening, you should come watch because Brandon's really fun to watch on video. All right. So number one was you love them unconditionally. Love them unconditionally. Number two, you set boundaries and you let them know that some behavior is just not going to fly. And you make it personal to you as opposed to right. putting it on them, right? This is not right. Going to me. Yep. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Exactly. Because the moment you give them the message of you need to change your attitude, and I've done it before, I've said that before. It's hard I've not said to. it the wrong way. Yeah. The moment we say that, it's I disapprove of you. Well, guess what message they're getting from the abuser? I disapprove of you. And now they're getting it from the one safe spot, the one person they knew was safe subconsciously. They knew that they could come to you. And if they get that message, then they are going to turn against you. And they'll start to gravitate even more toward this person because that's what power looks like. Mm -hmm. That's what protecting my feelings looks like. And that's what I want. The abuser will pick a favorite, by the way, and they'll pick a target. One of the kids will be their favorite and they'll groom them to also be the abuser. 
<clears throat> they'll pick a target mm -hmm. and the target will take over the spot that you used to have and will get the brunt. So what you need to do for the, the target is help them understand how to set boundaries for the abuser, the one, the one they're grooming is that unconditional love, the set boundaries yourself and to give them that safe spot to talk when they're ready, when they need it. Mm -hmm. You can't control their behavior. Yeah. So this is another, this is another cultural thing. Mm -hmm. We, my friend said it so beautifully in a Sunday school lesson. We shouted for joy in heaven with Christ's plan. And then we come to earth as parents and try to enforce Satan's. Yeah, I am. Um, I can remember actually sitting in a counselor's office and he was a member uh, back when I was still married. And we were saying something like, well, I just wish that the kids would behave. And he's like, you don't want the kids to just do what you tell them to do. That's not what you want. We're wow. both like, we don't. <laughs> and no, I, I agree. Because I, I go for my walks every morning. And usually there's been some kind of a tussle in the house, kids and just craziness. And I'll be for my walk. And I'm like, I'm like why can't those kids just behave? And I'm like, mm, that's not really the uh, plan. Why don't they just do what I tell them to do? That's not... That's that, not the plan. Doesn't that bring it into stark realization? Yeah, we want, Stephen Covey said it this way, we get social mileage out of the way our children behave. Mm -hmm. So if they behave well, we think it reflects greatly on us and that's what we want and need. We need those strokes ourselves. Our ego is tied up into it. So that, yeah, that's a great point is we have to release the ego in this whole thing and just realize, <clears throat> and this starts to you know pull at the heartstrings, we don't control how our children act. What we can do is have influence over them. The best we can hope for with teenagers, especially, is for influence. And the way to have that, let them know it's a safe spot. You're loved unconditionally. It's not based on your performance. And some behaviors just aren't going to fly here. Is it hard? Yeah. Is it a long road? Yeah. Is it going to work just like I told you every time? Heaven's no, yeah, of course not. This is real life, and it's messy. Life is messy, very messy. I was well, about to say freaking I, messy, but I know this is a PG show. <laughs> it is. It is a PG show. Um, and what are the, some of the things that I occasionally I can remember to do that work is that when things are not going well, is to take myself out of the situation, and like yeah. for, for some reason I always end up in the bathroom. It's like it's like the nearest place I can go and yeah. close the door. Yeah, and I'll go in and close the door. And one, I had a counselor tell me this once: go away and then think. Imagine that you're with someone that would give you good advice on how to handle that situation right there, right? Oh, like I a lot of times, it. I think of her, Stephanie, my counselor. Is she's as good as she's wonderful? But I will sometimes picture going in the bathroom. She probably think it's weird to be in my bathroom with me, but um, and say, Stephanie, you see what's going on out there. What do I do? You know, and then she could, okay. She's very calming. Okay. Well, you know, let's first, let's stay calm and um, let's talk through this. Like I, if you could do that, cause I'm kind of high strung. And so yeah. I get someone that kind of like, you know, okay. Yeah. Nice. Let's talk through this. And so I'll do that. Sometimes I'll pretend like there's someone. Um, and if I need the really big guns, maybe I'll go in and picture the savior. All right what do I do with these kids? <laughs> and he'll, you know, you know, I love you. First of all, I love you. Right. Yeah. And then, and I love them too. And like that right there, will start getting me back on the path right. I need to be on. But I feel it as you say it. Yeah. 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 I, I've learned what Matt Townsend calls getting in spirit and there's a whole steps. There's, there's a series of steps on it, but basically it's, it's, it's doing this breathing in. He says inspiration is inspiring, like you're in taking huh. in breath and yep. then picturing the Savior with you and then asking him, what would you have me do? And then whatever his answer is, you go do that. And so I, we did a whole episode on this getting in spirit. And um, so when I'm, when I'm doing well, I remember to try and do that regularly because whether it's coming from the Savior or if it's the spirit just telling me, or if it's just my higher self saying, you know, this is what the savior would say, right? right. Whatever, it's always good. It's always, yeah. but it's always, it always starts with kind eyes. You know, he's looking at me with these kind eyes, loving eyes, and then he lets me know that he loves me. And then he tells me what I need to know. And it's usually just like the next step forward. But 
um, that's like the most powerful thing that I do. I can even feel it right now when I'm thinking about it. Yep. Um, that when I do that, it's really powerful and helpful. Because if nothing else, it just reminds me instantly that I'm loved by my Savior and that I'm, I'm doing the best job that I can and that right. he's there to help me with my girls and he yep. loves them and he reminds me that how much I love them too. So it's pretty good. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. That's what came to mind as you were saying that. What song is that? He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. It's a hymn. What also came to mind is a phenomenal counselor would used to say, it's amazing that God lets us imperfect people parent one another. That's just unbelievable. That, that alone is why we need the atonement right there. Because we are imperfect people. We're going to mess them up. Another person I taught here fly with, this guy is a lifelong church education system member. He'd been in a bishop. He had been a bishop. He had served in a high council, whatever. And he said, when our kids turn 18, we give them $2,000 for counseling. And I started laughing. He goes, I'm serious. And I said, I, that's why I'm laughing, actually. Because if a guy like you who's so well put together obviously lives the right way, if you know you're messing up your kids, what's happening to the rest of us? Oh, yeah. It, that is so brilliant. What a great idea. That is actually um, really smart. I, I, honestly, I think everyone on the planet should be in therapy at some point or another. I don't see how anyone gets through right? their life without therapy, even if yeah. it's just for a few years or whatever. But um, yeah, I often will pat myself on the back and say, well, I'm not doing this to my kids like my parents. And then like almost immediately, my little smart aleck brain's like, yeah, you're just giving them other problems, <laughs> not the same ones, just different ones. So we know we're uh, going well, to screw them up somehow, but not the same way our parents did. Not the same way. It'll be different. Yeah, it'll be different. So David S. Baxter, single parent. So his talk is Faith, Fortitude, and Fulfillment, April 2013, I believe it is. Single parents, I testify that as you do your best in the most difficult of human circumstances, heaven will smile upon you. I like it. Do your best. You know what? I had a bishop say to me one time, this was like, I, I, I was, I took my girls back to visit California where I used to live and I saw, uh, we went to our old ward and um, I had been in that ward when I was married and I saw my old bishop and I was like, oh, my bishop. And he didn't know that we had divorced or anything because we had not kept track of each other. And when we went up to yeah. him and we saw him, this, this is as close as I think as I've gotten to, to talking to the savior in person because you know, he looked at me and he said, oh, and he's like, oh, look at these girls. They look so cute and everything. How are you? And I said, well, you know, we're doing all right. I'm a single mom now. He says, you know, you single parents should have capes because you're superheroes. And just getting that like affirmation in that moment. And so just, just like that, out of, you know, he, there was not a second of judgment or any, just, you guys mm -hmm. deserve capes. You're superheroes. Like I almost started crying right there. I'm like, thank you so much. Right. People that have been in abusive situations are not used to kindness. And so Correct. I can remember more than one, I, I remember one time uh, I was taking the girls for, we, we went grocery shopping and I was pushing them home in the stroller and I saw the sidewalk was closed in front of us because of construction. And I, I was like, oh crap, what am I going to do? It's a triple stroller. I've got three kids. <laughs> groceries, right? <laughs> so like, this was my workout back in the day. I'm pushing this thing and I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? Because there's a busy street, like this yeah. is a three-way street. And I'm like, a three-lane street. I'm like, how, what am I going to do? Well, this construction worker comes running over, sees me, grabs the front of the stroller, helps me quickly take it around and to the other side. Like, I was so unused to kindness. Like I right. cried for a good five minutes. Like I was yeah. so touched that someone would do something like that for me. Yes. So it's, you know, <laughs> seek out those kind people, you know, have kind friends. <laughs> that small act of kindness because you would never expect that from your abuser. They cannot do something like that. I have a friend who got yelled at for getting a flat tire. Oh my gosh. Yeah, because that's their fault, yeah. I mean, really. But you're just not used to that kindness. And so let me continue this on just for another second, which is this. The question was, what do I do if I have a child who's continuing this on? Look, you've been in an abusive situation. That's the nearest thing to hell on earth. Yes, there are some things potentially that are worse, you know, torture or whatever, but in a way this is. CPTSD is real. Complex, 
post-traumatic stress disorder. It's real. And it happens when you've been in an abusive situation for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And you start to have anxiety, sleeplessness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all kinds of conditions. Okay. So you exit that relationship still with those issues. Everybody does need a mental health professional. Those who have been in abusive situations absolutely need a mental health professional. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with this. You're trying to heal from this. You're trying to overcome. And a lot of times there's betrayal that goes along with this too. So you're trying to overcome all of that while providing physically for these little ones, spiritually trying to guide them in the right way when you yourself are so broken. This is why we need the atonement. And this is why we need to cut ourselves a break. Single parents, if you've been in that abusive situation and you are doing your very best to hold things together and just live another day and try to do what's right and help these people live better lives, you're doing a great job. Get the counseling you can, get the help you can so you're going to be even better and give yourself some grace and let him take the reins. That was awesome. See, I do this so I can get some free um, advice. <laughs> just kidding. Maybe you maybe you're getting what you pay for. I don't know. If that's <laughs> no, I, I I don't think that people that come out of these situations can get enough positive reinforcement. Honestly, it no. takes like people will say things to me, and it, a lot of times it's like I have a really hard time internalizing it. It kind of yeah. I can feel it. I can almost feel it like just going out you know the top of my head and and, and past me, and so I have to like really try hard to almost like grab that thought because I had some friends when I was in Houston. I went to see them get sealed and they said these oh, just wonderful things to me. Like I, I almost want to go stop because I can't, I don't know how to accept all yeah. of these things that you're saying to me. Like your yep. friends can see things in you that you can't. Cause I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like I'm not yeah. used to that. And so I have to go back and like remind myself, okay, they said these really kind things to you. Maybe you should try like internalizing them now and believing them. Because we have a really hard time. Those of us who have been in these situations have a really hard time internalizing positive things, even when they're true and you know they're true. Yep. Almost more so because we're yes. so, we've been conditioned to not. Yeah. It, it's almost as if you say to them, I'm rubber to your glue. Whatever you say bounces <laughs> off of me and sticks to you. And I think it goes back to the self-loathing that happens because of the message. You're not good enough. Then you did open up. And it wasn't good enough for that person. You got smacked down. So you don't want to believe it because when you do believe it, that's when the pain comes. And there's this auto shut off mechanism. Yeah, you know what? I hadn't put that together before. That makes sense because if you start believing that you're awesome, mm -hmm. then, it, then what happens when someone else comes along and attacks you for those things that you think are awesome about you? Because the abuser will attack your strengths. Yeah. First, they start with your weaknesses and that, that they can hold that over you. And you know you're weak in that area. And so you, they have leverage over you and you start to believe them. And then over time, they'll start to attack your strengths. Yeah. And then they've really got leverage over you because that which you thought was great, they tell you is not that great at all. And what do and you now, have? And what do you have? And now you're constantly trying to prove your worth to them. This is why they do it. Do you see the sick? kick that they get out of you trying to prove to them that you're worthy. You're working the whole time for the relationship, doing whatever they tell you to, to please them. They get sick joy out of you worshiping them. It is twisted. It is wrong. I know that the atonement is real. And I also believe that there is a special place for people who do that to other people. They might have some kind of remedial classes. Or something. Mm. Um, okay, so there's a good, that's a good segue into the third and final question for today. Um, yep. And a reminder to you all that are listening, this is probably just like the beginning of what you're wanting. And so don't forget that Brandon is your resource. This is the guy that can help you through this. All right, so the third question is how do you learn to trust again? Because, you know, again, personalizing it, I've been out of this my last, uh, my marriage, I've only been married once, but I've been out of that situation for five and a half years. And there's a part of me, like there's a really big part of me that wants to get married again. But of course, there's another part of me that's like, are you crazy? You opened up and you were vulnerable for someone. Yeah. And you got smacked down. 
Like what, why on earth would you want to be vulnerable for someone again so that you can get smacked down again? Why on earth would you ever allow that? Yep. So you're thinking just don't right now. Just, <laughs> just walk away. Just I, I am not a good resource for this right now, especially because I believe in the doctrine of marriage and I talk to a lot of people and there are very few that are happily married. Very few. It is so much work. Marriage is the hardest thing any of us will have to do. Marriage is not about your fulfillment. Marriage is not about getting your needs met. Marriage is about twisting you and bending you and creating of you a new creature. And again, this is where it gets so confusing in abusive relationships though, because you, you know marriage is supposed to be hard and I am supposed to change. I am supposed to adapt. Yeah. The problem is the abuser is telling you that no matter how you change, adapt, et cetera, it's never going to be enough, but you keep trying, trying, and trying to please them. And it's incredibly unhealthy. So very confusing message. Again, if you've been in that situation, cut yourself some slack, give yourself some grace. The way that we can trust ourselves though, at the end of this, so again, let me finish that point. I'm not a great resource for this. Because yes, I believe in the doctrine of marriage and I have to keep saying that. So, you know, like if ever there's a council that says, Brandon, you led people astray. I'm, I'm saying clearly, I, I know the doctrine of marriage. I just have a really hard time for those of us that are single within the LDS church thinking that happy ending, where is it right now for me personally? Okay. This is me personally talking because marriage is so hard blending families is amazingly hard then especially if you've got two people who are not emotionally whole mm -hmm. and you come together oh it's going to be a hard hard road although you know what i saw something a while back i used to do a podcast on being single i had a, a podcast for a year on being single in the church yeah and we had a lot of really interesting group discussions but one of them Harken back to, I can't remember who these people are that are psychologists. Anyway, there was a whole article on how you can grow together in a marriage and how they think it's, a, um, it's not a myth, but maybe overstated that you have to be totally emotionally healthy to get to have a good marriage. Right. A lot of times in a marriage is yes. a great place to grow. And so... Right. And I kind of think maybe I'll just preach to you a little bit, Brandon, since you talk to me. Talk to I, me. I really think it's more about trusting yourself instead of trusting yeah. the other person, right? Of course. Because like yeah. I look at it now and I say, if if for some reason I made a mistake and married another person that ended up being abusive with me, I would be out of that relationship so fast it would make your head spin. Okay. Right. I don't think I would marry them. But even if I did marry them, yeah, I would still I would leave. Because I won't do that to myself again. Yep. Because I've spent the last five and a half years learning who I am, healing who I am, loving myself, building myself to the point, building myself up again to the point where when I meet someone who I can see has that tendency, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, it's like the flipping the magnet where I'm like, you know, totally not attracted. I'm repulsed. Right? Yes. Correct. But I think it's trusting yourself enough to be able to say, I can, I'm setting boundaries. And if, if I come across someone who's not respecting my boundaries, then I'm leaving. Whether mm -hmm. that's within, you know, getting to know each other's stage or you've committed to each other or even in marriage. If you saying I'm now, I love myself enough. I'm strong enough. I have faith enough in myself that yeah. I'm going to leave this person I'm going to, first of all, set the boundaries and yeah. I'm going to insist that they are honored. And if they're not, then I'm going to leave. So it's, yep. I don't think it necessarily it's about trusting other people as much as it is trusting ourselves to do the right thing by ourselves and to nice. be there yeah. for ourselves. And so I, I, I know what you mean about marriage and not, you know, you and I talked before the other episode about how I had a, a conversation with the gentleman in my ward. Yeah. Been in church leadership positions for like three decades or something. And he said in his experience, he thinks about 10% of the marriages are celestial marriages. And then I think it was 40% of maybe not 
great almost wanting out kind of thing. Yeah, 40% are wanting out, I think you said. Yeah, and then, and then maybe 50% because my math's not great. 50% um, that are somewhere in between. You know, yeah. they maybe sometimes it feels celestial, other times it feels like they want out, like it's just kind of an yeah. average marriage. Right. And so I, I think that's probably pretty, it's, it's discouraging. However, all I can see from that is that 10% is my target. And that I feel like if, if you're willing to be humble, if you're willing to take a look in, in, in yourself and see where your issues are, if you're willing to go to counseling and, and honestly deal with those issues, if you're willing to, to work hard every day, if you're willing to be there for yourself and for your spouse, if you're both on that same page as far as being humble and willing Correct. to work, then Correct. 10%. Now, if only one of you is willing to do it, you're not going to have you this. Go. You've right? nailed it. And so it. you're both, and I know with every fiber of my being, I have all the skills that I need to be yeah. the 10%. I know, I'm not saying it would be easy. I think it would be very difficult, but I know I, I have the potential. And yeah. so I think if you could honestly say that about yourself, and I don't know you that well, Brandon, but just from the little I've seen, I'm guessing you have that same potential to have a 10% marriage. So maybe it's just trusting yourself a little bit more. Which is the topic that you're bringing up, right? Yeah, it's, that's what yeah, I, how, I bring how it do back we, to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not why I was saying that, but th this is the thing. And I think it's important to note, part of the reason why we might be skeptical to move in that direction is the idea of forever. Yeah. So because we don't want to be committed forever to a bad thing, we will stay far away from it. Mm -hmm. So that I think leads to part of what we see, which is, eh, I'm just not that interested, keep the distance, et cetera. So when you said, if it's a bad one, I'll be out faster than make your head spin. Mm -hmm. I think that thought is not a common one within the culture, mm -hmm. because again, the culture is, if I commit, this is forever. Right. Right. Yeah. And I agree. I mean, that it's like the double edged sword, right? It's forever. Yeah. Ugh. Or it's forever. 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 <laughs> yeah. Forever. But, you know, it, I think when you're in an abusive situation, Heavenly Father never wants you to say, I'll, I'll be no. forever. No. So, no, um, because then the other person is obviously not honoring their covenants. Correct. So I think forever gives you the chance to work together on, on things, not abuse. Now, if the abuser is honestly someone that's repentant and actually yep. going to change, which I say with a lot of skepticism because I haven't seen yep. it. Well, um, and, then, yeah, for good reason you say that. Yeah, because it doesn't happen very often. No, the studies, I can talk about it in a minute, but yeah, it doesn't. It just, it just doesn't. Maybe in the next slide they will. Correct. But... Um, yeah. If, if it's not an abusive situation and you know you've got forever to work on stuff with this person, then I could see it being awesome. You know, like, hey, this, like, we have forever to, like. To perfect this, yeah, right? Yeah, perfect this, right. exactly. You can never yeah. perfect an abusive situation. But when, oh, no. when it's not abusive and when you're both fully committed and humble and, and willing to work hard and forgive and forgive and forgive and repent and repent and repent. And repent then, yep, I, correct. I then, then it's good. Yeah, let's touch on that. And then I want to back up to something else as well. Two things. I had a friend whose daughter wanted to go to a party where there would be alcohol. They talked openly, honestly. Daughter said, yes, there will be alcohol. Mom said, I'd rather you not go. Now you notice that. I'd rather you not go. Mm -hmm. Didn't say, no, you can't go. This is how you teach people to use their agency. This is how you exercise influence appropriately. I would rather you not go. Well, mom, don't you trust me? Mom had a brilliant answer, this friend of mine. She said, honey, I don't trust anybody. Given the right circumstances, any human being can make a mistake. The only person I trust explicitly is Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Brilliant. So to this point of trust, no, you can never fully trust another human being. And I think some of us want that in a relationship. Right. I want to be able to totally trust this person. Guess what? They're a fallible human being. Yep. So good luck. So your point is excellent, which is the only way a marriage really works. And this is whether you come from an abusive past or not. The only way a marriage really works is yes, 
you work on you, they work on them, you work on the marriage and your relationship with God and continually grow together. Oh, that reminds me. The, um, uh, when I went to my friend's ceiling, the sealer said that the marriage was like a pyramid, a yep. triangle, but you have one spouse down here, one spouse down there, and right. Christ up here. And the closer you get to Christ, Correct. the closer you get together. And Bingo. I thought that was so awesome. And I thought that just, that makes perfect sense. Which is why an abusive relationship never works because the abuser can't handle you worshiping Christ. They need you to worship them. So they supplant and then they tell you that you're not worshiping Christ if you're not doing this over here. This is where spiritual abuse comes in. Mm -hmm. Well, you're supposed to honor me and you're supposed to defer to it. And it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, right. right? If it's the man saying it, it's, well, the woman is supposed to defer. If it's the woman saying it, it's, you're supposed to honor me as the mother. It doesn't right. matter, both ways. So it brings up, the National Domestic Violence Hotline does not suggest counseling in an abusive situation, couples counseling, because it's not a couple's issue. It's not a relationship issue. It's a, an abuse issue, mm -hmm. an abuser issue. So yeah, to your point that you can work on almost anything. My friend talks about the three A's of a marriage that make it really hard for a successful marriage, addiction, adultery, and abuse. If there's any one of those three, it's hard to have a marriage. Now, if you have addiction constantly, you don't really have a marriage. But if the person's willing to get help, you can fix it. Right. If there's adultery, oh, that's hard. That hurts. But if the person's willing to fix it mm -hmm. through the atonement, everything can be made right. Right. But if it's chronic and unrepentant, you yeah. don't have a marriage anyway. No, you don't. In the case of abuse, it's not like the other two. Yeah. Because the abuser... It's the antithesis of the abuser to actually change. The reason they're the abuser is they need power over other people. Why do they need power? Because they can't feel weak, inadequate, or worth less. To admit something is wrong and that they need to change would be a psychic blow that is way too much for them to take. So they can't look at themselves and change. The studies, the secular studies about can an abuser change are so inconclusive because the abused don't stick around long enough <laughs> to find out. Yeah. To see is this person really reformed, repentant? Well, yeah. Because how many years before, you know, oh. How many years? Yeah. yeah. If, if you're with someone for 10 years and they didn't change, are they going to change in the 15th or the 20th year? Right. And why on earth would you stick around to find out? So right. that's why I say it's about trusting yourself and not trusting the other person because yeah. you've got to trust yourself enough to say, oops, um, I got into another abusive relationship. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to take care of myself now and get out. So let's talk about this red flag. Somebody said, I know what a red flag looks like, but I don't know what green flags look like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all, we're always focused on red flags. Aren't we? we don't see the green Brilliant. Flag. But here's the thing, and we talked about this in episode one. If your gut tells you something is wrong, it is. Same thing in dating. How can you trust yourself again? Pay attention to your gut, which was right all along, and your abuser told you it wasn't right. That's why you stopped believing it. Mm -hmm. Get back to trusting your gut, because your gut will tell you when to run. Your gut will tell you this person's fishy. Your gut will tell you something about this does not feel right. Mm -hmm. The church on the Gospel Library app has the section of self-help, or life help, I think it's called, and then under abuse, they have a heading, what if I am struggling with trust? If you've been the, a victim of abuse, you feel like you may never be able to fully trust anyone again. You may question whether you can ever depend on someone else, yourself, or even God to keep you safe. The seriousness of some offenses explain why it takes you so long to rebuild trust and restore a feeling of safety after abuse. Then it goes on, I'm paraphrasing and paring down, but it goes on and it talks about how trust with somebody is like a bank account. If they're not making deposits into the account, why would you trust them? Mm -hmm. If they're making slight deposits and lots of withdrawals, why would you trust them? So how can you trust yourself again? Well, first of all, you develop that relationship with Christ. You get counseling, you get emotionally whole, as emotionally whole as you can, mm -hmm. so that you know why abusers do what they do. You know your tendency and why you're trying to keep pleasing them and chasing their approval. Mm -hmm. Then when you see the red flags or the withdrawals, it's really easy to say, thanks, I'm out. 
And one of the I cool would things, also say, yeah, take your time getting to know people. Do not allow yourself to be love bombed, like we talked about last time. Genius. If someone love bombs you, it's time to walk away. And I, I would say, if, listen to your friends and family and what do they think about this person? Because how many times you hear, oh, I never liked that person that you married. Yep. <laughs> I've, I've had some people tell me. I'm like, oh. I knew something right. was wrong. So yes. let, listen to other people. Because, because especially if you're getting right. love bombed and you're like, oh. Yep. Um, yeah. Take a step back and, and, and ask other people. And also, like, I even had my one counselor say, you can, if you start dating a guy and get serious, you can bring him in and we can all talk. And I was like, yes. I haven't brought anybody in. Right? I'll tell you something. But, um, yeah. That's perfect. So get people that you trust. Take time. If, if, if it feels like there's, yeah, something off, there probably is. Right. And so um, either walk away or get some other people's opinions. That's right. You're not really trusting yourself yet. It, yeah. If it doesn't feel right, do what Chicago recommends. Look away, baby, look away. Here's what else this, the uh, section in the app says. This is so good. Have confidence in the accuracy of your own observations of others' behavior. Clarify what others' behaviors add to or take away from your trust. Mm -hmm. Adapt the closeness of your relationships with others based on the level of trust that is built. And somewhere else in here it says, the other person is responsible for building trust if they want to build trust with you. If someone you decide to build trust with, uh, or if you decide to build trust with someone, determine the limits that are necessary to keep you safe. Some people may not choose to do their part in building trust and are not deserving of your trust. The Lord counsels us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. If you put up boundaries and they're just knocking them down or constantly pushing them, you mm -hmm. already know what you got. You already know oh, what that, you got. So just right? walk away. See, see, the only people who hate you having boundaries are those who benefit from you not having them. Yeah. Yep. Someone who doesn't care about you. And that's what dating is about. That's a good time to find out. Correct. Do they respect your boundary or not? Do they push constantly or not? Are they right. doing things like you saw the abuser do in the marriage? Right. Mm -hmm. The way that somebody put it is, how do they react the first real time you tell them no? Like, uh, hey, I have a company party coming up and I'd really love for you to come. If you say, you know what, I really don't think we're to that level yet. I'm not comfortable. If they freak out, they've told you everything. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I say take road trips, you know, travel together a little bit, not staying in the same place, but yeah. traveling together working serving together oh doing yeah things like that things like that where you can putting sit. ikea furniture together yeah <laughs> there you go exactly cleaning my garage out together pulling my sure. weeds together yeah, exactly <laughs> yes what else needs to be done around my hanging house? your pictures together plumbing yeah <laughs> whatever your house needs together <laughs> breaking my leaves together <laughs> all right uh, i think there's a good place to stop especially because we've been going on for about an hour yeah an hour yeah okay <laughs> It's a great topic, but um, thank you so much, Brandon. Thank you. I appreciate you giving airtime to this. No to problem. This is such a huge um, topic, so important. Yeah. And so I'm going to once again remind everyone that they can find you at stopemotionalabuse.net, on Insta, stop.emotional.abuse, Pinterest.com forward slash stopemotionalabuse, Facebook.com forward slash stopemotionalabuse.coach or email brandon at stopemotionalabuse.net. So probably if you Google stop emotional abuse, they'll find stop, you. Stop emotional abuse, Brandon, or I don't even know. Yeah, if my name's tied to it, but just go to stop emotional, emotional abuse.net. You can find everything else there. Yeah, it's, it's a good website. Lots of great um, resources. So, Thanks. Thanks. all right. Well, thank you again for joining me. Pleasure, thank uh, you. You're welcome. Uh, those that are listening, um, you can find me again on AnnetteTalks.com, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, yada, yada, yada. And uh, feel free to, <laughs> not yada, yada. Feel free to comment on AnnetteTalks.com uh, or on YouTube or on Facebook. And, um, or shoot me a message in Annette at AnnetteTalks.com and I will respond. So thanks for listening to Annette on Life, Liberty, and Happiness, where freedom lovers gather. Everybody.